I'm, I'm Lois Dinks from Port Angeles, from Stop the Checkpoints, and um, we could, um, like you said, we could use the $8 million that the Border Patrol is spending to build a big station for 50 agents in Port Angeles. We could use that $8 million to put into somebody working on straightening out the system or the taking care of the backlog even of visa applications and immigration stuff that's going on. We could use it for a lot of other things. We could use it for local law enforcement. Um, what they're doing in Port Angeles, our sheriff, uh, Bill Benedict, is going around to the Rotary Club and the Chamber of Commerce meetings and saying um, that the local government is short-staffed and we may have to cut back on our local sheriff deputies and city law enforcement. Um, and he, he is interested in finding out how he can um, deputize Border Patrol to function as local law enforcement in our county to save tax money. And I am absolutely against that. And I wondered, I don't know that all the sheriffs in the state are still on with that resolution that was passed, but um, he's selling this to the local business people and the local elected officials without the public really hearing much about it. Oh, we don't really want um, Border Patrol guys from, they get trained for two years on the southern border and then in border patrol stuff and then they come to Port Angeles and they're going to come and um, handle traffic accidents and check on home robberies and things like that. I mean it's okay to be available to help local law enforcement but um, this thing of, of why don't they just give the federal money to the local law enforcement and um, stop spending millions and millions in the borders, the Blaine sector, we've been trying to get statistics just on the Port Angeles area, but the Blaine sector, which is Oregon, Idaho, Washington, something or other, they have 370 some border patrol field agents, and last year they made 640 or something arrests. So do we need to spend that much money for each agent to make an average of two arrests during an entire year. I mean, something is really wrong with this picture, and you're right, somebody is making an awful lot of money off of equipping and selling gas to the SUVs and the whole thing with this Border Patrol station thing. What do you think of using Border Patrol agents to do local law enforcement? Local law enforcement remains, should remain under local control and, per, and performed by people that are part of this community, that live in this community, and are committed to this community. That doesn't mean, as you said, that we don't ask them to help from time to time. Uh, but uh, you know, we're the we're the folks that know the people in the community. Uh, we're the ones that built the trust. And you know, federal agents come, they go. They're on the southern border. They're in the northern border. They're in the northeast. So uh, we don't, we make it a practice. We don't deputize federal agents to perform local law enforcement missions, but we do ask for their help in setting up a perimeter. Uh, we have a pursuit or a hostage taker. We ask for their helicopter, those types of things. So Sheriff Alpo, I mean, and the first question that was asked or brought us around to the, to the idea of, okay, we know how terrible the system is. We keep hearing all these horror stories about, you know, our immigration system and how broken it is and the struggles to accomplish immigration reform. What are some, from your perspective, what are some of the, you know, the positives or signs that we may actually be able to accomplish immigration reform, um, you know, locally here or nationally? You know, I don't know any positive signs and I don't see any change in leadership or, or change in dysfunction at the federal level in Washington, D.C. on the horizon. However, uh, from the perspective of border security in our, in our northern community here in Whatcom County, I've seen major setbacks, uh, not improvements moving on the horizon. I mentioned the, the, the General Accounting Office, which is an arm of Congress. Uh, they recently issued a very disturbing report on the vulnerabilities of the northern border related to drug trafficking, firearms, and terrorism. And the report called the northern border very vulnerable and highlighted the need for increased local and federal cooperation. 
2007, I testified before Congress on first responder issues in border communities, and that resulted in funding for improved communication systems, uh, increased local patrols, training, and, and protocols that, that would sort out federal and uh, local responsibilities. And I think we made a lot of good progress. I think things are safer as a result. However, the current uh, budget proposed by Secretary Napolitano calls for transferring all the funding that's been provided to the northern border to the southern border. Uh, well, we have 387 border patrol agents in Whatcom County. They do stumble across state crime. They do not have authority, so they call local law enforcement. So these people end up in our local criminal justice uh, system and we have the cost of prosecuting them, the cost of defending them, the cost of jailing them, the cost of providing judges to hear their cases. And that is really a federal responsibility that they were funding, but uh, the new fiscal uh, budget eliminates all of that. Uh, we also developed a state-of-the-art mutual, mutual agency coordination center up near the Bellingham International Airport. And this was not only for law enforcement, this was for coordinating disasters, coordinating any of the vulnerabilities that could be associated with the border. And there was a commitment on the part of our local congressional delegation that this would be a legacy of the 2010 Olympics. Uh, funding for that has gone away, and it's not because our local congressional delegation didn't try, but Secretary Napolitano's budget cut that out. And that's going to have a dramatic impact on how decisions are made and, and the locals performing what is traditionally a local responsibility, the feds taking on uh, their role. So I don't see progress being made. I see actually we're taking some uh, steps backwards from my perspective. So Mario, then as an you know local organizer, you know, for the immigrant community, you know, similarly, are there hopefully signs, you know, of some positive moves or steps that you know, can be taken towards immigration, you know, just immigration reform. Uh, I don't know, I suppose we spokeswoman for the immigrant community, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think there, there are positive signs, and I want to talk about the positive signs in the grassroots community. Um, I think that in order to achieve real reform in any issue, it needs to come from the bottom up. And I think we're getting to that level. Nowadays, when we do um, a dialogue, it's actually well attended. In the past, when we had something, anything related to immigration, uh, going out there and organizing in the Latino community, maybe one, two people would show up. There was this fear, and it's still, still there, of, oh no, La Migra is going to be there, don't go, they're going to take you. Nowadays, people are fed up. You know, they're afraid, but they're also fed up. And uh, we can see it in the marches. Um, some people say that the, the marches began in 2006, but no. At least here in Washington, we started in 1999, right after. Um, we started organizing after the WTO in Seattle for immigration uh, reform marches. Um, and let's talk about Mount Vernon, right? Mount Vernon has been doing this for 28 years. So it's not nothing new. Um, but I mean, the fact that we're not only immigrants ourselves fighting for this, but we see our uh, white allies in the room right now. Like we have from the Skagit community, the Forks community. Thank you, Leslie, for coming all the way from Forks. Um, and they've seen their share of uh, Border Patrol fear. Um, and there's really our allies that are going out there, making sure, like uh, Port Angeles, that making out there saying, this is not right, this is outrageous. How can we be a country that we're seen as the top country in the whole wide world, and we're seeing these human rights violations right out the door? Um, so when we see the, the unity and the solidarity across colors across races, that gives me hope. The other thing is that we need to look back at our history. The civil rights movement achieved something, and we need to follow in their steps. The Chicano movement, I mean, the fact that um, Cesar Chavez uh, and Dolores Huertas and, and others were able to um, to uh, make Congress end the, the Bracero program. You know, there's, there's actions that come from social movements that make Congress do something and do the right thing. So what we see right now, uh, also at a national level, is the ultra-right wing fight against union workers. So we, they started with us, post 9-11, you know, well actually Muslims, then Latinos, 
and now they're moving to union workers. So who's next? So once, sadly sometimes, until you get touched by this crazy finger, then you're like, well, wait a second, maybe I should do something. So I think that, you know, economic recession, ultra right wing fights, we have a black president and there, there's all these crises uh, going out there, you know, calling him, asking for his birth certificate. Um, so once we get this humongous tension across the, the nation, across races, that's when we're starting to see solidarity. It's sad that it gets to that point. But my, what I want to get to is the fact that we students, union workers, immigrants, the Anglo community, the Afro community, every community, now little by little we're getting together there. And if we do it from the bottom up, then we can definitely get there. And the, la the other sign that gives me hope is the census data. So Obama administration and the Republican Party both know we are way too many. First they were afraid, now of balls becoming too many, but now it's the fact is that we're too many. Right? Like I've always said, we have children, my child will have children when she's older. Um, but the fact is that we are over 50 million of Latinos in the country. And most of us are able to vote, or at least we're able to influence the vote. We're going to have a new Congress, congressional district in our state. So all of this is going to push them to come and ask for our vote. So for us Latinos, we need to raise expectations. We need to, instead of asking, we should be demanding. We earn it. We work it. It's time for us to be able for that they come and request our vote instead of us requesting something from them. So um, again, people that haven't become citizens, become citizens. For the ones that are citizens, register to vote and vote really educatedly, you know, make sure that you know who you're voting for. Run for office. We need progressives to run for office. Um, so I have hope. I know this is not the year. I know 2012 is not the year. And we know we have to talk politics. Um, but it's not about the green card. It's not about the paper. It's about our dignity. And when we go out there doing the dignity dialogues and we're able to see people that say, Oh, you know, I read these policies and they all suck. They're terrible. Even if they give, they say, they come in and say, okay, sign this paper, I'll give you the green card, but there's all this in between, I'll say no. So I'm really glad to go out there in my Latino community, present all these policies, and they come and say, this is not enough. We should ask for more. So I ask to everybody, raise your expectations, ask for more, and work in solidarity. Thank you.